Thanks for coming. My name is Chris Primesberger. I'm a senior writer with eWeek. I'm also an editor, and I'm also a blogger. We're all bloggers. And um, thanks for coming. You know, I'm very gratified by this turnout. Not only you know, do we honor our, our panelists up here, but you realize that the VMware CEO is also having a super session at exactly the same time as this. Do you need, did you guys realize that? If you need to leave now to go see him, you can. It's okay. Actually, tomorrow morning, um, uh, when uh, Paul Moritz uh, makes his keynote, he'll be, make, he'll be you know, talking about the news tomorrow, so you won't miss anything. Anyway, thanks for coming. Our topic is Virtualization 101. So we're, um, we're not going to be just talking about rudimentary things here today. We're going to be talking about real-world issues and solutions. And um, our distinguished panel of guests up here represent... A uh, very interesting uh, smattering uh, of the virtualization world. We've got a great ve couple of great vendors up here, and um, people who are actually working in the real world here to explain some stuff for us. And I'll introduce our our uh, panel right now. Ken Barth is an industry expert. He's a former CEO of Tech Tools. Ken, you can uh, raise your hand just for a second. Uh, Brian Bond is a senior storage manager at Logitech. Probably all have Logitech mice or uh, speakers or other things. Josh Stevens is vice president of tech and is the head geek at SolarWinds. SolarWinds is our sponsor for this morning. And um, last but not least is Lazarus Vecarides. Did I say that right? Vecarides. Vecarides. I'm sorry, I've only known him as Laz. He's the director of software engineering at Dell. So um, could each of you maybe just take a minute and explain your roles uh, at each of your companies for us? Sure. I, I, I guess I'm, uh, we're going inversely alphabetically. So uh, I'm, I'm Laz Bekuidis. I'm uh, director of uh, software development at Dell at the uh, Equalogic portion of the house. Uh, I actually was uh, part of the core team, uh, the management team that put together uh, the original storage arrays uh, at Equalogic. And I, uh, I basically was there from the very beginning uh, right through the acquisition until today. Uh, my uh, role uh, currently at Dell is uh, to supervise pretty much all of the software development that uh, has anything to do with storage management and systems management as it pertains to Equalogic. Uh, I deal a lot of uh, I deal with a lot of uh, different uh, host operating system uh, problems and uh, the the uh, virtualization aspects of of host operating systems are something that I deal with um, you know pretty regularly across all of the product lines that uh, I help develop. Uh, and uh, I've watched this, uh, this, this whole virtualization thing uh, just grow up from the very beginning. So uh, I have, a, a, I guess, a very uh, unique perspective with respect to that. I'm Brian Bond. I'm with Logitech. And I am the senior storage administrator there for their global operations. And I... Uh, like a lot of you, deal with issues every single day, dealing with virtualization and all of the things we're going to talk about. Hi, and I'm Ken Barth. I'm the former CEO of Tech Tools. Uh, Tech Tools uh, made a product called Profiler, which uh, managed storage. And uh, prior to that, I was one of the founding shareholders of Micromuse, which was a network management uh, application. So I've been in the reporting and network management space uh, and storage space for, golly, I don't want to tell you that because it'll give you an idea of how old I am, but uh, quite a long time. And uh, why I'm here of particular interest is because when we first began building our storage management tool, what really drove the need for storage management was the advent of virtualization. So virtualization definitely causes a layer of complexity where you need visibility into it, which is one of the things that we worked on very hard. So this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. So thank you. My name is uh, Josh Stevens. I am with SolarWinds. Any SolarWinds users out there, fans? Quite a few. So uh, we're actually a producer of industry-leading IT management applications, traditionally in the network engineering space, and more recently in the systems and application management space, uh, virtualization and storage, uh, now working with the Tech Tool technology. And so my role there at SolarWinds uh, as the VP of technology is a CTO style role. So I help drive product strategy and direction. And as the head geek, I do a lot of education for our community. Uh, I own community 
uh, education and training within the company. So we, we spend a lot of time out providing free educational uh, material to people within the IT industry that are having trouble coming up to speed and keeping up with all the new technology and trends. You know, we taught a, a webcast last week on, on cloud computing, for instance, just sort of the basics of cloud. And, you know, about a thousand people signed up and then showed up to just, just hear about it and learn because, as you guys are well aware, your CIOs and CTOs are coming to you every day with outrageous claims and questions about, hey, you know, should we be doing cloud? I keep hearing about this. And people need to know more about it, so we focus a lot on that education. We also provide a lot of free tools, and we're actually giving away some USB sticks in the back. Julie back there can hand one out to everybody. And those USB sticks have some free software on them for managing your virtual infrastructure. And everyone who came to the booth today is able to get one to the presentation. So thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys. First of all, we're going to quickly just do some definitions here, just so we're all on the same page. You all know what virtualization does and what it, what, what it is in general. We're going to touch a little bit on desktop virtualization, server and storage virtualization. And at the very end, we're going to talk about virtual I.O. and a little bit about virtual databases. Not a great deal, but um, I do have a little bit of background on that I want to share with you. Um, uh, as far as going into detail on these, I, you know, I can touch on this, but I'm sure you guys all know what this is about, you know, guys and women, by the way. Um, but um, first of all, um, uh, we, I think that what we should do is maybe talk about the workload, uh, also the workloads that we're talking about here doing. At the server and the storage array, and also the VDI level. Um, and um, could each of you maybe touch on the kinds of workloads that you work on, um, and um, uh, at this point, whether you're specializing in one or the other, and uh, just uh, maybe some of the issues that you've come across. Virtual, uh, VM, VM sprawl, of course, is a major one, which we'll talk about, how that starts, and maybe some of the best practices uh, in, in which to deal with that. Uh, did you want to start that off, Brian? Yeah, certainly. When, when looking at your, your, your overall virtualization environment, um, you know, a lot of you probably started the same way in that uh, there was one or two things, and then there was five or six things, and then all of a sudden you went crashing down this hill, and a lot of things were virtualized. You started finding things that were virtualized you didn't know about. All these kind of very strange things started happening. And what you have to do very, very quickly uh, from, a, from a storage administration perspective is you need to get a grasp of what's going on. Why all of a sudden, when uh, I decided to virtualize 500 systems or 50 systems in some environments, did the performance on my my SAN or my or my NAS just completely go off into the weeds? Why are some of these systems performing better than some of these other systems? And uh, to be honest with you, the first thing you need to do is you need to find a tool that will help you do that. Whatever that tool happens to be, you need to have something that allows you to see your entire environment from soup to nuts, from top to bottom. There's, there's no way you can do this without doing that. F once you have that type of thing in place, then you can uh, look at where you are, see where you're going, you can predict what's going to happen as you move forward. And the largest types of things uh, that I have seen is that people will come to you, ask for systems. They won't tell you the specs. They won't tell you how it used to perform on the physical box. You've converted it to virtual, and now it performs, you know, you know, like dog food. It's like, what's going on here? Well, if you don't have that information to begin with, how are you going to be able to compare, you know, apples to apples, you know, at the end of the day? So, <clears throat> pardon me, if you have physical systems or you have similar systems, you need to be able to have a way of, uh, of quantifying that information as you move forward. And without that, there's no way that you can help your end user. They're going to say, virtualization is terrible, my application doesn't work anymore, I want it back on physical boxes. And, 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 and you've lost the battle, and you'll never, you know, it'll take you years to get that group back into place. So you need to be prepared for that. You need to know where you are now on your storage side. You need to know as you're moving forward what's happening in your environment, and you need to know how to be able to tie that back to the systems that you're virtualizing going forward. 
uh, you know, new systems are even worse. But definitely that's, like I said, the first step is understanding where you are before you start to go forward. Okay. Ken Barth. I mean, I was right. going to say, and Brian, to carry, carry that one step forward, what a specific example is, I mean, how many of you know orphaned, MD, uh, orphaned uh, VMDKs? Have you guys ever run into that? You can have a ton of those out there. And what it can have is you, you've sold your system based on, hey, this is going to save me a lot of money. And before you know it, you're eating up tons of storage, and it has ripple-down effects because what happens is you're eating up that storage, you also have disaster recovery initiatives that are taking place back there. You're having snapshots, if any of you have like a, a NetApp environment. You're doing a lot of the snap mirroring, so all of a sudden everything is exponentially growing, and you've got to go back to your boss to justify the next purchase, and it looks very unsuccessful. That's why, as Brian mentioned, you really need to kind of get a handle on it. Visibility is the key. There is absolutely no question that virtualizing your environment, particularly from a server perspective, can save a ton of money. But what happens is it can also cause issues in purchasing decisions on down the road. It can cause issues with SLAs. Uh, root cause analysis becomes a little more difficult. So there's some thing forecasting and trending becomes a little more difficult because there's another layer in there. That's why, as Brian mentioned, it's important to kind of get a plan Keep visibility as much as you can and learn how to track it. Real, real important. Just to echo a couple of points that, that you guys stated there, I mean, when you think about the way we would roll out application servers historically, there was a built-in set of processes that had to occur that gave you some time to do some planning around that deployment. You know, you would see a purchase order come in through a vendor. You'd probably spec out the physical hardware for your team. You know, the order then went out to Dell or somebody else. The system came in. It was built out. It was imaged. Then it was plugged into the data center. You, you provisioned a, a jack on a switch somewhere. You thought about bandwidth utilization. You know, today, we've, we've really automated that entire process with just a couple of clicks of a button. And in many cases, you won't even know when these application servers have been deployed. They'll simply start sprawling without you even being aware of it. One day you'll have a couple of hundred virtual servers. You know, a few months later you'll look down and you'll have double that many and you won't really even know why or how or, or how it occurred. People will start using, uh, you know, application servers for single use now. It's easier to basically have an application server in a virtual machine world that that is really a single application. And in many cases, think, people think about you know, an exchange server as an application today as opposed to being a server, because it's simply a file and an instance on your virtual machine server. So one of the first things you can do as a best practice is start to build procedures and processes so that you are made aware and you're able to track the provisioning of virtualized resources in much the same way you did back in the physical world. Now, I'm not suggesting you would slow it down to that level, but you do need to have processes in place so that there are some checks and balances and you're made aware of those things. Because not only, as Ken said, you know, do you have issues around the consumption of storage resources, uh, something that we now have to be aware of are the constraints around storage I.O. And, you know, I.O. can be, in many cases today, the leading indicator of application performance issues. And it didn't exist like that in the old days. In the old days, we sort of took I.O. for granted, right? It was a locally attached set of disk controllers with lots of battery backed up, on, you know, onboard caching. And we didn't really think about things like that the way we have to today. The other thing that's dramatically different today than it was in the past is that resources that we, we used to take for granted um, are now actually a part of the bottleneck. And in the old days, we would think simply about, you know, WAN utilization and how much bandwidth do I have available there. I might think about CPU and memory on the server side, and maybe even some storage space. But now we're actually seeing circumstances where you may have so much uh, data moving back and forth in the data center that you have to actually start thinking about LAN utilization actually right there in the data center. You may, I, I've seen many customers where their 10 gigabit uh, links between their switches are fully saturated. And as vMotion starts occurring and you start seeing more automated procedures happen out there in the virtualized infrastructure, suddenly the fact that you have one tool for doing uh, virtual server monitoring, one tool for VMware, one tool for the storage arrays, one tool for the network side, a different tool for application performance, different tool for network congestion analysis, it can become really, really hard to figure out 
where exactly that bottleneck is occurring and why that server that you virtualized three months ago is now suddenly performing at a level that's unacceptable to the users of that application. And so you want to be sure that whatever tools you use, um, they offer some sort of integration and get you as close as you can get to a single pane of glass to see all of those different aspects that will dramatically affect the performance of the application you know, in the eyes of the consumer. Yeah. Laz, with your background at uh, Equilogic and Dell, could you maybe define real quickly the difference between VM sprawl and VM stall for us? VM, well, I, I was actually just going to start to to echo some of the things. You, you could, know, one you, point you could also do that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, w one of the interesting uh, trends that we've we've seen over the last uh, seven or eight years is that we. we started with data centers that were largely underutilized. And so uh, we, we always took for granted that you're, you didn't really have CPU or memory bottlenecks. You never had network bottlenecks. You really didn't have these things. What we've effectively done uh, with virtualization uh, is we've turned those assumptions upside down. And uh, so I, I frequently talk to customers as they start to load up their data centers. It's, um, you know, they're, they're busting through bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck. Uh, and and uh, to, to everyone's point here, uh, it, it's not, you need a, a suite of tools that can really pull together uh, an entire system view. Uh, it's not just the storage I.O., uh, it, it's the network I.O. I, we always knew when we, we built the, uh, the first iSCSI uh, array that it would break any network switch out there if we, if we did the right things. Um, so, so we knew we could create a network bottleneck. We had no idea that with enough virtual machines, you could create all sorts of other interesting bottlenecks that, uh, you know, it's not just the network. Uh, suddenly, your CPUs are all completely utilized. Uh, suddenly, uh, you can actually, I, I've heard uh, anecdotally of, of actual memory bandwidth bottlenecks, um, which is uh, astonishing. Now, for a system geek like me, it's actually a lot of fun. I sit there and I say, well, wow, we're going to have to build some cool stuff. Um, to fix this, but uh, you know, at the same time, you you, you need to have uh, the the right set of tools. Um, I I know that the the tech tool suite was actually one of the 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 very first uh, monitoring tools that that we actually had, and and uh, you folks were there um, very early on, uh, and and you've helped a lot of customers. But this is uh, actually you know one of the the interesting problems that I think. Uh, no one actually thinks about because they're still in the mindset of thinking that their resources are not fully utilized. You can get 100% utilized really quickly. So, And the um, bottom line is there, if, if a bottleneck can happen anywhere, it will happen. Yes. And it can happen in unexpected places. A uh, quick note, just to remind you, uh, the last 20 minutes of our discussion will be Q&A, so we're looking forward to that. We want to hear your specific uh, uh, problems and, uh, and, and questions and uh, about what we're talking about. We'd, we'd love to do that. So, uh, And also, there's a note as you leave, don't forget, maybe I'll remind you before we're done, there's a, gonna, there, there's going to be a free, a free USB uh, stick that SolarWinds is offering everybody with some tools on it. So you, you get that for as a thank you for coming today. So in addition to all the information you'll take home with you, you'll take home a physical stick today. Okay. Um, uh, we didn't really define, can we define VM sprawl versus VM stall real quickly? Who, can I have a volunteer for that? I think we know what VM sprawl is. We've talked about that a little bit. But what's VM stall? Our panel is stumped. Do we know, do we have anybody out here that knows? <laughs> I'm going to take a guess at it. We're all looking at each other going, it wasn't on my list, but I'll take a shot at it. Okay. Um, I think what they're talking about is, is what I touched on a little bit earlier, is when you have... When, I'm going to when, go to Wikipedia real quick. <laughs> that's right. You can go and check it out. So I'm, I'm going to dance for just a second. <laughs> we'll get but, your answer for you one way or the other. I'm assuming what it, what it was I was touching on is you, you go to, to the folks to get the money, and then you start deploying everything, and all of a sudden everything looks great, but you haven't really thought about the knock-on effect. You start with server virtualization, which is the, the beginning and the easiest place to start where you save the most money. And then the next thing you know, you're having a knock-on effect in your disaster recovery. You're having a, an effect on the storage utilization. It, it's just cascading through, and, and all of a sudden you're out of backup licenses, and you know, you're finding out that uh, you're using, you've implemented Site Recovery Manager, and because it's not monitoring the snap mirrors on a net app, that you're not keeping in sync with it, and you really don't have a good disaster recovery plan. That can lead to, I think what we were talking about is VM stall, which means you've gotten some momentum going, 
and all of a sudden you've just, you're dead in your tracks. Because when you go back to get the money, they're going, well, wait a minute. You didn't think this thing through very well, right? So it's, it, tools are important, but thinking through the process, I think, is step number one. Understand that, that just one step down the virtualization path, think through what you're going to be doing. And it's fantastic technology, absolutely fantastic. But you need to kind of understand that it introduces a, what I call a knock-on effect. Right? Very good. How's that, guys, for VMware Stall? Pretty good, huh? Okay. Just to offer a different opinion, uh, I did look it up on Wikipedia, and it's not on there, so it doesn't exist. It's not a real word. Okay. <laughs> uh, there we go. I mean, that is a definitive source anymore for... We have. It's, We've it's solved it. That problem yeah. used to no exist. The only reference I could find to it, actually, was for this presentation, so... Okay. Uh, apparently, it's not real. <laughs> well, I, uh, I have to plead ignorant. I didn't, I didn't write the notes on this, but it's okay. It sounded good. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Let's, let's just look at this statement. Gartner re revealed uh, a, a year ago that uh, only about 18% of enterprise data center workloads that could be virtualized had been virtualized. And uh, six, there's another note here. Six months after the survey was conducted, that number jumped to 22%. And it's probably closer to 25% as we speak today. And um, the prediction is that this number is going to increase by more than 50% in 2012. So we're looking at half of all the workloads in the world being virtualized within two years. That's a lot of change. That's a lot of uh, uh, consolidated systems. That's a lot of software. And um, I just think that's a, a very interesting point as to where we're going. We all know where virtualization's going, okay? And now it's a matter of anticipating where it's going and having our systems ready for it going forward. The, the uh, complete, incredible growth of data is driving all this, obviously. Now we're going to go to this next one. We're going to talk about these current challenges and best practices right now. That's what this topic's all about. Um, bottlenecks. I would like uh, us to take a look at some typical bottlenecks right now that you see. You don't have to go into great detail about what they are. We talked a little bit about them already uh, and the challenges in your environment. And then let's talk about the pain points first, if we can, each of us, that you've experienced. And, uh, uh, and then we'll talk about how, we, how we, the solutions came about for them. Laz, you want to start? Sure, sure. So um, I, I think I'll take a timely one. Uh, VDI. Uh, VDI seems to be um, top of mind uh, for us uh, at the uh, Equalogic side of Dell uh, for, for a number of different reasons. And if you look at the overall system architecture, uh, you're basically pulling up uh, as many virtual machines as you possibly can uh, in as dense a footprint as you possibly can. The whole business case around VDI is a hardware consolidation business case, right? So there's no reason to ever do it unless you can save a lot of money on desktops. And so by itself, the concept should, should be telling you bottleneck. But l let me tell you about some of the experiences. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the first thing that uh, we noticed was that, you know, the customers, the early customers trying VDI, um, uh, they had, uh, I can't name the, the actual customers, but um, I never knew what a boot storm was yeah. until about, <laughs> you know, a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, the entire system on a SAN was pretty much frozen solid. Uh, and it was uh, a combination of a CPU bottleneck, an I.O. bottleneck, uh, and a network bottleneck. Um, it, it, it was something that I'd never seen, and we spent an awful lot of time trying to tease it apart. Uh, so for, in, in VDI installations now, uh, and this is just sort of you know, best practices right now, uh, multipathing, if you have a SAN, you need to have as many paths set up as you possibly can. Uh, it, iSCSI, for example, and, and it's near and dear to my heart, so I can talk about iSCSI. Uh, if if uh, 10 gig infrastructure is at all feasible for you, use that. Uh, you, you, will, you will be much happier uh, with as much throughput as you possibly can uh, over there. Uh, there's, a, a, you know, once you remove that bottleneck, then we start to see that there's still a physical limitation to the sheer number of desktops uh, you can run. Uh, you know, VMware has taken care of some of the scalability issues with uh, the, the latest release of, of uh, vSphere uh, with some uh, advanced uh, clustering protocols so that you know, 
storage vendors like us uh, working with, uh, with VMware can actually allow um, better or greater utilization of the disks. That was one of the bottlenecks. Then, uh, you know, just the sheer I.O. Uh, from a standpoint of spinning media required to boot up, oh, I don't know, 500 uh, virtual machines at once, that will also slow everyone down. Your users will be very unhappy. Uh, so the next technology that we're introducing these days is SSD. So uh, I'm sure, as I haven't seen, uh, the, the, the booths aren't all set up yet, but uh, you know, when we all walk through that show floor, everyone's going to be talking about SSD and, and how it actually multiplies the, uh, the number of, of desktops you can actually use on a per-unit hardware. Uh, then, of course, the, there's a next level of, of uh, virtualization. I mean, now we're talking about, and there's a lot of thinking going on these days on caching within the host. Uh, so the technologies that we're talking about with VDI, for the most part, everyone is booting the same desktop. Uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to allow all your users to customize their desktops to a great degree. Uh, so there's a lot of commonality between those images. So in theory, the theory goes that you should be able to cache this stuff uh, and actually never even go out into the, the, the network or the SAN. So th this is just sort of uh, an entomology of, I think I mentioned at least four or five bottlenecks yeah. in this one application. Uh, I, I'm not, we're not done yet with this. Uh, and right now, uh, per array, I believe per Equalogic array, we're in the order of five or 600 desktops for one array, um, which is actually pretty good, but I know that a lot of people out there are thinking much bigger than that, yeah. and uh, you know we're, we're going to be building this technology up over time. But these, this is just sort of a, you know an anecdote tells you just just the level of, of complexity that we're dealing with. Can I ask a general question before we go to the next speaker? How many uh, people here, whose companies, are either using a VDI system right now or thinking about using it? Maybe within the oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, within the next two years or so. That maps exactly with what eWeek is finding and, and of course, all the analysts. Uh, this, is, this is the time for VDI, I think. I think it's, this, it's ready. It's been ready for a while to an extent. The technology has improved tremendously in just the last two years or so. And the latency problem has almost gone away, not quite. And um, it's, it's ready for prime time, I think. So uh, I just wanted to see that. Uh, Brian, go ahead. You know, as we've, I think we've all mentioned already, the the bottlenecks exist in places they never did before. You know, we, we you had a server, you had no problems. You, you know, you just you ran it. You needed more CPU, put another CPU in it. Well, since we're sharing that all across now, every single part of the system is now a potential bottleneck, and. You, you get them now in places that you didn't think you'd ever get them before. You've got an enclosure full of blade servers. Everything's great. This is the way to go. It's nice and dense. You've got a great big switch in the back of it. You saturate that switch, and every single VM that's attached to a host on that switch is now offline. That couldn't happen before. It just it wasn't possible. So these these are you know as we move down this path, we're introducing more and more complex problems that that weren't there before. We're utilizing so much more of the hardware. Um, that as we said before, if you can utilize high bandwidth bandwidth links in between systems, do so. You, you'll be happier with it. You're not using it at all. That's great. You will at some point in time. Um, and, the, and the same thing applies back on the storage side. If you start off with a SAN or a NAS that's adequate for your needs today, you will blow it up. I guarantee it. Especially if you're looking at VDI. You'll get, you know, you'll get the bootstorm issue, whatever. But what you want to be looking at is a way to be able to, to manage that process going forward. I already touched on it earlier, but you, you want to make sure that you are able to see what is happening on both ends of that system. You've introduced maybe three or four hops on your SAN switches now, where it used to be you were connected maybe directly to the switch where your storage was, and now you're going through a smaller switch to a, to a hub-and-spoke technology. Maybe you've got a director out in the, in the end. You need to be able to see that end-to-end -end and understand what's going on, all the way down to the LUN level. And, and the real pain points actually come... When you, when you fail at doing that. 
the the only pain points that that personally I see in in you know my virtualization efforts over the last couple of years were when we didn't think an application through, or we just thought, you know, what the hell? We'll virtualize it. You know, you, you need to look at the entire application. There's a system that it's tied to over here. Maybe it's a physical box over here that runs through a different networking system than your virtual infrastructure works through. You'd need to be able to see your entire application plan from top to bottom to be able to understand what's going on and be able to predict what's going to happen and then understand why you're in the position you're in at that point in time. If, if you can't do that, you're not going to be successful and all it takes is one or two attempts that fail for you to get into the stall mode and not be able to move forward with the rest of your virtualization efforts. I'm going to make this quick ditto because it is, it is really about root cause analysis. That's probably the biggest bottleneck you're going to face is where you used to be able to go. You had an Excel spreadsheet and everything was mapped directly to the other. It's now all about end to end, as Brian was saying. That's, your, that's the big, and it's all out there. You can get the information. You just need to think through the process. Maybe it's collaboration with another business unit. You know, whoever owns the servers, if you own the storage, if you own the, so you've got to really think that process through, right? Yeah, I mean, not a lot, to, a lot to add what you guys have already said. I guess I would make two points. Um, you know, number one, I think that as technologists, when we see uh, trends and, and moves in the industry, we need to start planning a little bit earlier than we used to. Because in the old days, when we thought about rolling out a new application, it was really all about the application server, and, and the requirements were sort of on the edge of where the app was going to be. And in today's environment, the edge is, is virtualized, and we have capacity there usually. And what we're finding is that the capacity issues are in the core, they're in the infrastructure side. And as infrastructure engineers, uh, that's a lot harder to invest in, it's a lot more expensive, it takes a lot more planning. And so a, a little thing like understanding that your users um, are now thinking about moving uh, from HP to Windows 7 uh, might seem like a small thing until you realize, oh, well, we might decide to use that as an opportunity to roll out VDI. And that might become the indicator of why you need to change from fast ethernet to gigabit to the desktop. And that might be the, the indicator of why you have to move to 802.11n on the wireless to get more speed for the wireless users out there who are now doing VDI through a wireless access point. And these things can kind of snowball on you if you're not paying attention. And, you know, these are things you'll probably have to plan for a year, 18 months in advance to make those sort of investments. They're, they're big infrastructure changes. So invest early. The other thing to think about from a pain point and also sort of a best practice is when you're leveraging, you know, virtualization, specifically with VMware, really be aware of the network infrastructure that's being virtualized inside of that box. And, you know, if you're an old school network engineer like me, the fact that you've now got these switches with very limited uh, control functionality, very limited security functionality and, and traffic analysis features um, is a little bit spooky. And that's why, you know, VMware and Cisco have partnered to develop uh, the Nexus 1000V, which is Cisco's virtualized switch that runs uh, within the vSphere server uh, and actually sort of replaces the built-in ESX switch leveraging their APIs. And that switch is a full-featured uh, Ethernet switch just as if it was physical. Security policies all the way down to the port level, true access control, traffic analysis with NetFlow. So really think about the technologies you're deploying and look for additional technologies that might make it easier down the road, might make your capacity planning, planning and analysis uh, workloads easier because those things will, will sneak up on you really, really quickly, and, and you'll be the ones as infrastructure specialists that, that need to have the answers. Thank you all for that. Uh, we're going to skip item three. We're going to right, <laughs> go right into approaches and methodology. And um, one question I want to ask the panel, um, and by the way, we have about maybe 12, 13 minutes left of panel discussion before we go into Q&A as far as uh, my clock is concerned. Um, I'd like to know um, about this. How important is vendor lock-in when it comes to all this? Because um, vendor lock-in is a word that we shy away from. It's, you know, it's this bad thing out there. You don't want to get tied in too deeply with one company, one system vendor, because bad things can happen. Um, um, how important is that in this situation? Because 
everything is getting so complicated now, isn't it just easier and more efficient, saves money and time and effort and everything else, if you've got that one throat to go for? When it comes to control of all this, what are the pros and cons of that approach? If we could just get a, a quick perspective from each of you on that, I would appreciate that. Sure. So, so yeah, I'm a vendor, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dell, uh, you know, I have to say, Dell, Dell is open standards and is very legacy friendly, is it yes. not? Oh, no, yes, absolutely. So and, you don't have to throw away everything. No, we're, we're, we're very, very pro uh, open standards. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, though, one of the, you, you mentioned the one throat to choke. It, it, I think of it from the opposite perspective. I have to own your problems. And uh, you need to pick a vendor that gives you that same warm and fuzzy feeling. And, and you know, I, I hate to say it, but sometimes, given, uh, and I talk to customers a lot, given some of the problems in, in these leading edge technology areas, it's really good to have someone you love that will own your problem. Um, maybe even more than being uh, locked in or not locked in, it, it may even be more important. So you, you have to balance these things. Uh, and you know you're, it's your money, and you have to decide. And now that said, there are a lot of things, and Dell is is really good. We're very good at, at articulating where all the open interface boundaries are. Uh, and when you pull out a, 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 you know your your entire system architecture, you should always at least have in mind how you can swap out pieces, parts uh, where necessary along these architectural breaks. Uh, so that, at the very least, you can uh, you, you can play me off against my competitors, uh, if, if nothing else. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of evolution, technical evolution, happens along these boundaries. And as problems get solved, it's actually really important not to have to wait for vendor X to support the FUBAR standard. Uh, it, it is much easier for you, especially if you're uh, a leading edge user and you're you like you like the pain of being the first. Um, it's very, very, very nice to be able to, to swap parts out and, and bring in you know, the fastest SSDs, for example, uh, or, or the fastest network switch. So it, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act for, for you folks. Uh, and uh, there are vendors out there that are less vendor neutral than us, and there are others that may even, you know, they may have a very similar story, but it, it's, it's up to you to decide uh, who will own your problem, and that, that's really how you should be evaluating this. Very good. I'd have to agree with a lot of that. I mean, ownership of the problem is, is a big deal. The last thing you want is to call the vendor and have them say, oh, that's the network guy's problem, or oh, that's, you know, the manufacturer of the, of the CPU. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, actually dealing with a VAR might solve that problem for you. If you can buy a lot of your gear through somebody, that has uh, localized uh, management skills with those different companies, and you can deal with them and say, look, I'm having an issue. Can you help me figure out what the problem is? Because the vendor is not being very responsive to that. Um, it, it is a delicate balancing act. You have to decide, OK, I mean, everybody knows in here that if you've got SAN or NAS and you want to replicate that between sites or even just between frames, you can't do that from vendor A to vendor B. So now you've got to buy a lot of vendor A and a lot of vendor B to be able to support that. Okay, well that's, that's a situation where you're kind of locked into vendor lock. You, you've got to build that in from, from the start. But then your backup solution. You don't want to have to have a backup solution that's different for each of your storage vendors or each of your uh, systems vendors. You want to have something that's, that's completely and totally agnostic and reduce that down to a, to a single pain point, if you will. So you have to find what works best for you, and those relationships with the vendors are probably the most important part of that. If you don't feel you're getting the relationship with a, with a direct contact with the vendor, try to step back from it and insert somebody into that. And the exact opposite is true. If you're not getting that out of your VAR, step up. Be demanding. It's your money. It's your equipment. It's your livelihood. It's your company. You own the problem. Make your vendors own the problem on top of that. And if they aren't, change. Don't just go, you know, these guys suck. Go to the next guy. Give them an opportunity, and then you can own that problem and be successful. 
I agree 100 percent. Brian originally started with the it's the vendor's problem. It's really your problem ultimately. And I have to tell you, you guys have the power. I have been, you know, um, you know, hitting my head against a wall for years trying to get a lot of vendors to work on open standards. And we're a long way down the road thanks to your hard work. I think what Brian said, as long as you folks stand up before you buy and say, hey, I want this to be open because it gives you tremendous leverage in terms of price, in terms of uh, service, in terms of deliverability. So I'm a huge fan of, of openness and being open. And, and the only thing I will tell you, it, it is ultimately you folks own the problem because you're the ones that are ultimately going to be responsible. And as Brian mentioned, make the vendor stand up for you. And maybe that's a VAR in some cases, but that is definitely the way this thing needs to happen. I'll, I'll try to keep my answer brief. Um, I liked what you said, uh, Laz, around uh, IT professionals sort of liking the pain. I believe that most of us in IT are, are a little bit masochistic at heart and that we do sort of enjoy that part of our jobs. We like to be out there and, and be first. Um, my perspective is a little bit different, though. I mean, I agree with uh, where you can partnering and sticking with a single vendor. I do believe that there is some power in terms of when you're trying to have that single throat to choke and, and having leverage through another vendor uh, to be able to grip that throat a little harder. Uh, and so, you know, I do believe in, in an environment where you try to have at least uh, another vendor introduced. The complexity is to, to do that in a way that it doesn't uh, add additional risk to your infrastructure. Do it in a way where it's self-contained, where it's sort of on its own, where it doesn't have any integration requirements. And there's a possible thread that you could, of course, expand their presence, but it's probably unlikely. And I feel like in, in many situations, uh, just having been on, on your side of the table for a lot of my career, um, I've always liked to have a little bit of that power. So on the networking side, I might have used Cisco in the core and, you know, Aruba for wireless, or I might have used Riverbed for my WAN, et cetera, just to have someone else in the mix that could check it up a little bit. Um, you know, last but not least, we, we kind of talked about getting experts, expertise from your evaluated resellers and, and your partners out there. Be sure that whatever vendor you're working with has a strong community. Be sure they have uh, a network of professionals that are, are fans and customers of their technology where you can go out and, and actually collaborate with your peers leveraging that same technology. You know, uh, SolarWinds, we have you know, around 500 employees or something like that, but we have over a million and a half active users that, that collaborate through our community website. And while I would certainly like for us to be able to own all of your problems and, and work with you diligently on those, it just doesn't scale to that level. And so, you know, be sure that they have a community to augment what the organization can offer, and that can be a, a tremendous asset as you're out there rolling out new technologies, especially in these bleeding edge technologies where the vendor may not have seen that problem before, but maybe your, uh, your friend from another organization has. Okay. To summarize, because this is kind of the, one of the, this is kind of the meat of this whole discussion here this morning, um, is that uh, it seems pretty obvious, but these are important things. You need to understand your environment and your needs across the stack first, and that's not trivial. Second of all, you've got to create the plan that you need, and you have to look ahead. You've got to look at trends, read eWeek, InfoWorld, and the others, find out where the trends are going, and then create your plan. And then uh, after that, you need to get your tools in place in the performance monitoring, storage, virtualization, utilization, optimization, and capacity planning. Super important. Um, and then um, in the tools, the in, the, in, the, in the ideal environment, which technologies and products do you need to adopt? You need to do that research and then adopt them. Um, and then, of course, the elements required to effectively optimize VMs uh, where or, or, or Hyper-V or Zen server, whoever, whichever hypervisor you're using in this environment, too. You need to know what, those, what the requirements are for, the, for your system there. And then, uh, I guess, uh, real quickly, and then the user perspective here. If we could just touch on this, just uh, on a headline basis here, or a little synopsis basis. Discuss um, uh, how you need to have products that, uh, that will allow you to see the changes, how everything is connected and allow you to see before and after you virtualize a specific environment. That's really important to put everything in perspective. Josh. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. It's one of the things that's most commonly overlooked. Um, people forget to do a baseline before the deployment, and it's, it's really hard to combat the argument that you mentioned where a user says, oh, you virtualized my application server, and now performance sucks. I want to go back to a physical server. Um, you need to have the data. You need to be able to say, well, actually, 
Uh, performance always sucked. It was bad before, and it's bad <laughs> now. Uh, so, you know, how can we work together? Or maybe it is a little bit better now. Uh, recently, a good friend of mine called, and he was building out a big knock for uh, a leading healthcare provider here in the U.S., and he said, he said, oh, I need your help to build this out. We want to, you know, my boss says I have to improve availability and performance of all these applications. And I said, great. Well, uh, what, what's the application and availability of metrics say for the last six months or a year? He says, well, what do you mean? Right. I said, well, where are you starting? He says, well, we don't know. So well, how, how are you going to prove that, that you made it better if you don't know, you know, where you are? And so you really have to be sure that you get those baselines established, that you have analysis applications to not only show each piece of the application infrastructure, but to also show you that user's perspective. Because if you can say to me that the virtual server is performing well, that the SAN is performing well, the, the, uh, the, the, the fiber channel network is performing well, the Ethernet side of it is performing well, you know, everything looks good, but the user experience in the application is poor, then none of the other stuff really matters. Right, you need to be sure that you're actually able to capture the user experience of the application when they open up a browser and fill in a form and submit a ticket, or when they send an email through the server, whatever they're doing with that application, what is their experience level? And then based upon thresholds you define for when that experience level might get better or worse, be able to see within the application infrastructure and see where the bottlenecks are occurring. That's really what we're talking about here. I think that that's right on. The only thing I'd add to it is that before virtualization, it was very easy to determine where the problem was because it was just point-to-point -point mapping. Now, if you have a user that calls you up and says, hey, my application sucks, you can go back to him and say, hey, I don't have any idea why it sucks because I can't figure this out. Or you can go back and say, hey, I've determined there's an overactive LUN out there, and oh, by the way, it's mapped to this VM, and your application is residing on that VM, so there's the problem. And with a little bit of planning, all these abilities are out there if you just take the time to think it through. Okay? What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Not even looking at improving performance going forward. It's, you know, it's the old doctor's adage, you know, first do no harm. Do not make the application worse than it was before. And if you don't know where it was before, you don't know if it's worse before. The, I can't even tell you the number of times in the last five years I've had somebody say, this is horrible, but they can't quantify what horrible means. And you don't have any data to look at to be able to say, well, yeah, there's a difference in the graph and, and something is horrible. You, you, you know, you, you can't you can't work in non-quantifiable answers. So you've got to have information to know going forward. And like I said, don't make it worse. And once you've got it, maybe you can make it better. So I'll just say ditto. Uh, so the, there's, uh, I, I think overall, uh, you, you, when you virtualize, you eventually are, you're starting to be a service provider in a new sort of way. And as a service provider, you need to have a complete set of tools to measure uh, ahead of time, before and after. This is, uh, this is something that uh, ad hoc virtualizers don't generally do. Um, I do actually know anecdotally that there was, uh, and I can't actually mention vendors, but there was one application that accidentally ran better under VMware than it ran on a physical hardware. Um, doesn't happen very often. Uh, <laughs> so you, you, you may get a freebie once in a while, but uh, most of the time, uh, all you're doing is you're forcing your users to share infrastructure. So you know, understand that that's, that's going to cause some consternation, and you need to be there with, with the right set of tools. Okay. Well, that's our virtualization 101 discussion. We have just a couple of things I'm, I'm gonna, I wanted to point out that everything's going to be virtualized right now, sooner or later. Okay, never not now, but soon, probably later, and not that far in the future. Um, right now, you can buy virtualized I/O. Uh, there's a company called Seago. Begins with an X. It doesn't sound like it, but uh, they have an appliance that you can add to your system that uh, suddenly changes the uh, the input output quite a bit. Cisco has this also, but you have to put together a couple of uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of their products to do it. It's not quite as simple as plugging and playing something. Um, databases. I, I mention this because this is a story that I'm working on for eWeek, and you've heard it first here. It'll be out next month. It's a company called Delphix from Palo Alto that's starting up. They're, they're running. They already have customers, but they're not going to be debuting their product until next month. 
and it's a virtualized database. In that database, what it is, is a database that's in production that's replicated and tethered elsewhere so that you can change it, update it, do anything you want with it. It doesn't affect production at all, but it's connected. And imagine what, how, how freeing that can be to anybody who's a database administrator. Um, very interesting. So we'll have that story as soon as uh, we can next month. Uh, Delphix, by the way, was founded by the guy who started uh, Avamar, uh, deduplication company that, that EMC bought for 165 million. The guy's 33 years old and he's already on his second company. It's unbelievable. But Jed Yua was a great guy. But anyway, you'll be reading about that. Those are things we're looking forward to uh, in, in the immediate future in virtualization. So, you know, servers we've been doing, storage we've been doing, we've been uh, VDI is. We were just talking about that's going to take off. I think right now, but we have other things that are coming down the pike. Okay. Next, we're going to do questions from you. So if you would like uh, to ask a specific question, we love details. As a journalist, I love, I love the examples that you guys gave today. I mean, I'd like to hear more of them. If anybody has a question for any of our panelists, now's the time to do it. Or you could leave, and you could get your, <laughs> you could get your memory stick and take off. Do we have, uh, do we have one? We have, a, we have a man right here. Yes. What has been your different experience with tool? Single pane glass tool sets. What's been your experience? I've, I've used several. I've settled on one that people here know all about. Um, <laughs> trying to phrase this right. You really need a single pane of glass. There are several people out there that, that do this type of thing, and some of them do it differently. You need to find something that, that gets you what you need, and different tools will fit those things differently. Uh, the reason that I like the SolarWinds tool is, is that it gives me storage to VM end-to-end. -end. You know, just like they mentioned earlier, I can be looking at a VM performance graph that's showing me CPU, disk, and, and memory usage on a particular VM, and I can click through and find the host it's on and what the host performance is related to that. And I can keep clicking, and I can find the storage system that it's on all the way down to the LUN level. And then from there, I can see the other things that are connected to that LUN, and I can go back the other direction. So that gives me that complete loop of being able to look at everything you know, that I possibly can. And, you know, now that that tool is being tied into the regular SolarWinds tools with the networking, I can go completely down that path as well. And I, I think that's, that's the importance there, is finding something that gets you the data that you need to be able to, to make those assessments as you go forward. Yeah, just to add to that real quickly, uh, without seeming self-serving, obviously. Um, but, you know, in the old days when you thought about management applications and single pane of glass type features, um, the applications were really hard to use and typically took weeks or months to get up and running. So it was really hard to test drive them in any realistic way. Um, but with today's technology, that's not true any longer. So, uh, you know, whether you buy from us or from anybody else out there, what I would encourage you to do is, is to try the applications for yourself. Um, just like you wouldn't buy a car without driving it for yourself, go actually test drive it, see it work in your environment, see how comfortable it is to actually use to solve problems with, and then based upon that, make a decision. But there are several applications out there that are easy enough to use and install, configure, that within an hour or so you can actually be collecting data and start to see value. And I think that that's the key, is that we've, we've sort of upped the game for management technologies to where we do actually expect people to do you know, head-to-head -head bake offs and try them both out. And if they like ours the best, great. If they don't, then, you know, that's okay, too. But at least give it a shot. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Question? So I don't have a hands-on lab at the show, but you can go to solarwinds.com, and there's a hands-on lab available online. It's all web-based. You can actually access it from there and drill down and, and see uh, data in our infrastructure, just like it would look in yours. And that's it. Uh, so SolarWinds.com is the, the website, and the tool is Orion. And within the Orion family, you'll see actually now both networking application systems and storage and virtualization. Josh, are some of those tools on the stick? 
Yeah, on the stick, there are uh, links to the evaluation versions, and also she's saying no, so I guess not. No, there are not links to the tools on the stick, but at SolarWinds.com, there are links to the tool. Instead, on the okay. stick, there are some free uh, tools that we've developed around virtualization. The newest one's called VM Console. Uh, I wanted to call it VM Bouncer, but they said that nobody would know what I was talking about. But it actually lets you just uh, monitor and bounce your VMs and do snapshots from your desktop without having to log into uh, to vCenter. Okay. Yes, sir. It's a great question, and his question was, with the number of tools and applications out there, even from a single vendor like SolarWinds, uh, is it possible to get too much information, to have too many tools? And yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you don't, you, for instance, with our applications, uh, we ship them out of the box to be uh, somewhat standalone, and when you combine them, you, you need to do some customization to really filter out the data that you don't want to see and provide that click-through feature that, that Brian mentioned earlier because what you really want to have is a high-level dashboard view of where the, the hotspots are and then drill down from there. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're actually uh, retooling some of the Orion suite so that'll be even easier and building in the storage and virtualization technology and that'll be shipping out here pretty quick. Questions? Yes. Repeat, so. the, repeat the question. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, so, so you're saying you've got uh, data stores that are, that are sprawling across multiple back ends. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I have an answer already. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is this is this is one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's you you. This is one of the uh, the the things that uh, I, I spoke of earlier. So um, we never actually talked about storage virtualization, but that that's one of the problems that storage virtualization solves. Um, what what you have effectively done is you've you've striped your uh, your your lawn across. You know, three disparate pieces of infrastructure, and depending on where uh, a particular VM is operating logically on that on that set of blocks, you're getting different performance. Right. Uh, and, and so that is, and I don't know whether you, you know Solar Winds or anyone actually has a tool to to, to profile that, but that is a, a devious problem. Uh, and and. Right. Yeah. The, the, the suggestion I would make in this particular situation is, is you need a tool that looks at that entire environment. You need something that, you know, it, God forbid it's different types of storage, but you need something that's completely storage agnostic and you can look across that env environment. And you can then go and group that information. You can say, this LUN or this RAID set that I want to look at has all of this information and this RAID set is part of that. And you can put it together and maybe the information's coming from different places, but you can look at it at the end of the day and get your total IOPS across all of those different things and be able to say, okay, you know, that doesn't seem to be the problem. Maybe it's a, a networking issue because I'm going to a different frame and that goes across a, a, a different piece of networking infrastructure. But that's one thing that SolarWinds allows you to do is you can go and take 
the back end pieces and group them for a front end view, or you can take the front end pieces and group them and get a complete back end view off of them. So you get, you get all of those things put in one place, so you're kind of looking across that entire platform. It's a, it's a unique problem, but you certainly can solve it with these tools. You, if, if you get the, once you're getting the information, you can rearrange it in a way that allows you to see the problems and what you're looking at. And the key, you know, to your question earlier about too much information is no. You can't have too much information. You can look at too much information. Yeah, there you go. Once you've got the information, you can then realign how it's set up so you can view it properly. If you don't have the information, you can't ever look at it. So that's, that's the key, I think, is, is get the information and then find a way through it. And to be honest with you, the guys at SolarWinds, if you call them and say, I've got all this stuff and I have no idea how to put it together in an end view, they will walk you through it. And they'll, and they'll help you figure it out. They may not solve your problem, but they'll help you find a way to look at it in a way that makes sense to you. And that's the key to using the tool. Yeah, that's the key to using the tool, is making sure you understand how you're looking at the data. I can't imagine that that wouldn't solve the problem. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that you can't do it without having a problem, but it, it, clearly, if you, called the, if you called the storage vendor, they're going to tell you, stop that, fix it. Yeah. Oh, sorry to hear that. No, that's too bad. Do we have any other questions? We have just a couple minutes left. Sir. You may want to tackle that? From my perspective, from your perspective, I see that being used more and more. Um, I actually heard a discussion on this yesterday where uh, VMware is looking at expanding their SNMP infrastructure. And all I could think of is, why are we doing that? Why aren't we moving to something that's a little bit more open and a little bit more you know, you know, easy to use across all of the different platforms? So. Most of the storage vendors now are supporting that, which allows you to use a single tool to be able to go in and get the information and have the same information from all those different types of storage. And that's the big thing, because even just five years ago, when you looked at your HP array, you got different information than you looked at with your NetApp array, than you looked at with your EMC, and you had no way of knowing really where the problem was because you didn't have the same information. So I, I see it playing a much larger role as we go forward. And, and I agree with Brian. That it, but the reality of it is it will never be a know-all and end-all because even, even like SNMP where you have the different levels of MIBs by each vendor and you've got to tailor it, same thing with SMIS. You, you do have a base level of information that most of the storage vendors have. So I would say from your perspective, as long as you've got really good SNMP monitoring skills and you really hold your vendor's feet to the fire about SMIS, between those two things, you can probably, in the end, get what you want, right? But you're going to have to have both, okay? I strongly dislike SMIS. I'll roll on the record. <laughs> you know, I, it'd be great if, if, if there was one set and it worked for everybody and it was easy to read and understand, but, you know, you can't write an application that will support everyone's SMIS. You have to write individually for each, each provider. And for each, and for each, you know, cluster, for each piece of hardware. Um, so while the technology is great because of the level of, of detail and granularity you can get by talking directly to that to that device, um, you know, I, I'm still hoping that there will be some some standards development done in that area that will give us uh, an, an easier way to to get a broader set of functionality. Because today, when you when you buy, you know, our storage management tools, one of the the strongest things that I have to invest in is adding support for each and every piece of storage hardware that comes out because they're all different. And let me just echo that as well, but it has come a long way because what, what you have now is you have one, as a vendor that deals with, you know, multiple devices, you now have one set of calls that you, your people learn instead of 25 different sets. So it's, I agree with you, it's still got a long way to go, right? But that's what we were talking about, about the power of the, the purchasing folks, push it, yeah, right? I understand. <laughs> All right. All right. We have just a minute or two left. We'll take one more question.
that, there, that there's reasons to do that and not to do that. Interoperability is the reason to do that. And with what you're just describing right now, I believe that. Yeah, I would too. I think I was the one that was talking about having some leverage, but I would do the same thing. Uh, I would look for other areas to maybe have another vendor representative to be able to push on that vendor. You know, it may be that, you know, after you build this new site, you put a WAN accelerator on the outside of it or a firewall or just some, some other way. Or maybe in a, another site you've got out there uh, where you've, you know, acquired some technology. Maybe you don't replace that other technology so quickly. But absolutely in those environments, uh, there are a lot of advantages in going with a single vendor. Um, for sure, all the way from the core to the to the end user, and you know, the wireless is a little a little less valuable, but but even there, there's some some advantages. It's especially true in your situation where you're talking about ground up opportunities. If I could go back and do all of my storage right now, I'd probably use one vendor for it, just because I want to look at SRM, I want to look at you know replication across MPLS networks worldwide, all these different things, I probably would do things differently. Um, so, you know, I kind of envy your position of a clean slate. Yeah. I, I think you... Yeah. The, the downside is to that, the, the downside to that environment, and this is something that, that I've always felt, is that doesn't allow you often to do best of breed for the individual components. You're pro in my opinion, you're not going to get the best firewall. In my opinion, you're not going to get the best, you know, campus-wide wireless product. Those are the types of things you're not going to get. But are they going to be more than good enough for you? Probably. Thank you all very much. It, um, our time is up. Uh, it's lunchtime. That's why a lot of people decided to head out. They're doing lunch early today, 11.30. So. Thank you all very much. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank uh, Josh and Ken and Brian and Laz for joining us today. You guys have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye.